Chapter 12 of Winning His Way by a Self-Made Man This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 12 In Which Prosperity Begins a Set Towards a Green River Argus Frank Morris's face wore a grim smile as he approached the blazing ruins of the Benson House, which he had to pass on his way back to Green River. Probably a dozen curious people had assembled in bunches at a safe distance to view the conflagration and speculate as to the cause of it. "'This'll make another good story for the Argus,' said a man who recognized the young editor. "'Being on the ground yourself, you'll have the bulge on the times.' Frank nodded pleasantly as he reined in his pony and dismounted to ease the intense smarting of his thighs, which the motion of riding had increased to an almost unbearable degree. "'Some tramp must have started the fire unwittingly.' remarked the man. No, said another spectator with a humorous twinkle in his eyes. The ghosts did it because the Argus showed them up Saturday and they wouldn't stand for it. That's right, said Frank without a smile. The spooks who haunted yonder house lately were known as the Ancient Order of Associated Ghosts, and while they were holding a kind of hijinks here tonight, they set the place afire by accident. Now they'll have to look up another haunted house. Ha, 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 laughed both men. That's pretty good. You speak as if you knew all about it, grinned the first man who had addressed Frank. I ought to, seeing they invited me out here to report the proceedings for my paper. That's pretty good, too, snickered the other man. What's pretty good, inquired a third spectator joining the little group. The other repeated Frank's remarks for his enlightenment and the newcomer said the young editor certainly ought to report the item in his best style. I mean to, replied Morris. Nothing of importance gets by me. You young newspaper fellows have got great imaginations, said the third man with a grin as he slapped Frank on the back. Ouch! shouted the boy, hopping almost a foot and making half a dozen different kinds of faces. What's the matter with you? asked the man who had caused the trouble while the other two looked at Frank with surprise. "'Don't do that again, please,' said the boy in unmistakably earnest tones. "'If you had gone through the roasting I did tonight at the hands of the associated ghosts, you'd kick yourself.' "'Associated humbugs,' retorted the other contemptuously. "'You don't suppose you can cram any such rot as that down our throats, do you?' "'If you had my back, you'd know whether it was rot or not.' "'What's the matter with your back?' asked the man curiously. Go over to that fire and stand there for ten minutes, and you'll know what's the matter with it. I guess you're joking, young man. All right, have it your own way. And the boy started to lead his horse homeward. If you want to learn all about the fire, don't miss Wednesday's Argus. I certainly will look to see something unusually funny on the subject, the man shouted after him. Hardly had Morris disappeared in the turn around the road when six boys came along, escorting a seventh who looked as if he had been through a thrashing machine. "'Hello,' said one of the three men. "'Here's another chap that looks as if he'd been up against the associated ghost, as Morris calls him.' The three spectators grinned broadly. "'Who are you laughing at?' snarled Duncan, who noticed that the men were grinning. "'We're laughing at you, if you want to know,' said the third man coolly. "'Well, don't do it,' snorted Roach, feeling mad all over. "'What do you take me for?' We take you for a pretty badly bungled up boy. What's happened to your face and hands? And you look as if you've been in the water, too. It's none of your business what's happened to me or whether I've been in water or not, retorted Duncan in the same ugly tone. It won't do you any good to get mad over it. We didn't know but the ghosts who set the haunted house afire had roasted you, too. The three men laughed again, and the six boys looked at each other in surprise. You go to grass! growled Duncan, starting off down the road, his companions following. "'What the dickens could that fellow have meant?' asked Walt Edwards, looking at Eddie Hicks. "'You got me,' replied his friend. "'It was a funny remark to make, all the same,' said Edwards, scratching his head. "'One might almost imagine he knew something about what's been going on at Benson's before the old thing took fire.' "'Not likely,' said Eddie. "'Merely a chance remark.' "'He riled Duncan, all right.' snickered Spencer Lickett. You don't blame him, do you? Think of the way he feels. I wouldn't have his dose for a farm. We'll have to steer him into a drug store and have him fixed up before we take him home. And they did as soon as they got to town. Wednesday's Argus had a column and a half on the first page about the destruction of the haunted house on Monday night. 
and the ancient order of associated ghosts received a humorous roasting, which, however, was only intelligible to the young fellows who had participated in the mad prank which led up to the fire. Frank was careful to cast a mantle of fiction about his story, so that not one not in the secret would suspect the true facts in the case. The young chaps themselves had got a hustle on, and had procured thirty new subscribers and six five-dollar advertisements for the Argus. This was as Walt Edwards had promised, and Morris assured them that he entertained no hard feelings over the affair, though his poor back still did give him a twinge as a reminder of the eventful occasion. Dan Harwood had set up a large handbill and employed several small boys to paste it on all the vacant walls and fences throughout the immediate neighborhood of Green River. It read as follows. Are you looking for easy money? Buy the Argus and see what a simple matter it is to make one hundred dollars. Squire wrote, saw it, and sneered at it. So did Mr. Jebb and his friend Robinson, who thought they knew how to make one hundred dollars easier than that. So did Bentley of the Times, and his foreman Billings, who saw nothing good in anything that issued from the Argus office. But hundreds of the good people of Green River read it, and many were impressed by it. Regular readers of the Argus were already on the tiptoe of expectation about the advertised story without a title, and probably three-quarters of them expected to make a try for that one hundred dollars. A title is such a simple thing, you know, that anybody thinks he can make one to fit any story and so he can, after a fashion. The problem is to make one which fits the subject like a glove. And if it is a competition, like the Argus scheme, to make a title that fits better than anyone else's. Then it is like picking up money. Everybody interested in Green River figured it out that way, and those who were not already subscribers hastened to send their half dollars for a trial three-month subscription in order to get in line. That is why the cash began to come Frank Morris's way during those early July days, and by the time he had collected all that was in sight in the county, the women's magazine and other monthlies in which he had advertised came out, and what Frank called foreign subscriptions began to flow in the direction of the Argus office. In the meantime, the job department had also got busy on the bolt and lock catalog. Eight first-class jobbers have been secured and sent on from Chicago Typographical Union No. 16, and things began to hum, much to the disgust of the proprietor of the Times, who saw his preeminence as the first printer in Green River slowly but surely slipping away from him. After Frank had talked several of his best customers away, Mr. Bentley began to cut prices. Frank Morris immediately appealed to the people to support the fair and square principles of organized labor. Every one of his jobs bore the union label, and every one was a sample of first-class workmanship. The Argus itself was much better printed than the Times ever had been, and the public was of the opinion that it was much the better edited of the two, and the result of it all was that an intense and bitter rivalry sprang up between the two papers. End of chapter 12